just so tall and so big as he got older. And um, Perry was in the household. All the family members were saying, Perry, come here. Perry, come here. And if we seen other people call him another name, we knew you weren't a family member. <laughs> you know? So um, that, that was Perry, a guy that temporarily had the opportunity to cut a lot of people's hair. Because uh, in our neighborhood, a lot of people had chili bowls. Uh, their mom didn't have any money, so their mom just put a bowl on their head and just cut their hair <laughs> for school. So he took it upon himself to cut their hair. And he also, when he had a chance, he bought uh, certain, certain people around their shoes and stuff like that. So George was, he was, if he was a car, he would be the ace of spades. He was, he was one of a kind. He was, people loved him. Calvin Murphy, everybody come by. They, they just wanted to see him. Lorenzo White, they used to all us. Everybody came to see him because he was a great person. The day that we met George Floyd over the um, air was not, of course, in the most pleasant of light, but in all of our conversations that we've talked and I've gotten a chance to learn the family and learn a lot about him, in about a minute or two, because there's a lot you could say, but in about a minute or two, tell us who George Floyd was in his younger days. What was his potential? What, what were the things that he was doing that most of us don't know? Uh, believe it or not, George, uh, when he moved to where all of his friends are now, um, he was he wanted to play sports and he wanted to be active in the community. So he would go to church because that's what mom wanted all of us to do. But the fact that they played sports and you know when people don't want you to play in front of them, they want to play. So it's like, hey, we we know you better than us, but we don't want you to play. He realized that he can out jump people. He realized that he was faster than people. And then he realized that all of these people, like mothers and fathers, they like him a lot more than they like their own kids. <laughs> Honestly, uh, they will go to the mall and they will always say, we're taking George. Because George, really, he looked out for all of his friends. Uh, he made sure nobody was going to harm them. People would just, when they see George, he knew everybody from other schools. He played at some of the places like Elijah Warren played at at Bundy Recreation and University of Houston. He was there. He had the opportunity to meet these people. He cleaned out the lockers at University of Houston, like for Elijah Warren's shoes and for Clyde Drexler and all those people. He had the chance to meet all of these people. Um, George, um, he was an uh, advocate. He would take kids to the YMCA. Wow. And he would take them in to show them, hey, I, I need you to play this sport because in our neighborhood, it, it got to the point where it was gang violence. People started having gang violence and different sorts of things. But George, he went, he would always tell people, put the guns down. That's right. And that, that's George right there. He was, he was a person that made sure that if you didn't have nothing to eat, he will always bring you to my mom's house and make sure you have something to eat. A lot of people, their moms was on drugs, their fathers was on drugs. Some of these people didn't even have furniture in their house. Some of these people wanted to come stay with us because they didn't want to be at home. And George used to always make sure that they get something to eat, they get fed. If they want to go to school on time and they needed people to walk because the police if you were in school on time, they would get you and then they'll come to bring you home. And George knew that your parents were on drugs. They didn't, he didn't want you to get in trouble. So he would extremely try to get you there as fast as you can. And he would drive you there, or if you walk in, he would make sure nothing would happen to you. You can get to school because that's what he was looking for, people in our neighborhood to prosper. We, we all realize, and I think we've seen it in our own personal life and obviously in the lives of those we love, that sometimes the tide changes in our life. Mm -hmm. Something happens, we go through consequences that might affect the person who we were originally 
and that might change and make us do and be other people. Unfortunately, at our worst times, sometimes we are seen and evaluated. And in this particular case, on the morning of May 25th, we saw an unfortunate circumstance evolve. Had George been involved prior to that with law enforcement? He had, uh, to me it was fatal because the stuff that he went to jail for, he didn't even do it. He had, uh, these same guys called when George was murdered, they all called crying on the phone. George had then said, hey, I didn't do that. And they went and picked me up for no reason. They had um, one of them where they tried to get, get him like five years. He had did like four years and a half. But the little, the little, one of the little boys for that case, he told them he's not the guy. And he didn't do anything. But the police, they was like, no, it's him, look at him, it's him. So they really forced the little boy to say it was him. He didn't do that. They had another guy who had his car, his car stolen. One of my brother friends, he wanted to swap car, cars with my brother. So my brother said, okay, because they grew up since they were young. You can tell, you can have my car for me and I'll just drive yours. It turned out the car was stolen. So in reality, my brother didn't even have to go to jail for that because the other guy, he just passed away too. He was a rapper in Houston. He just passed away. He was the one driving the car. But my brother had told him that his friend gave him the car so he would just take whatever it is, the time or whatever, because he figured the guy was going to come and say, hey, uh, it's not him, but the guy didn't say anything. So my brother ended up getting time for that. And the, the guy who car was stolen from, he was saying it's not true, but he was scared to, coast, to go to court and stuff like that. So from, from that point, he had one more case where they had police officers, this guy, and he was giving everybody bad cases. And he, did, he was just giving anybody a case. And my, my brother had told everybody, I didn't do anything, I didn't do nothing. This same guy took a fake warrant to, it was some white people's houses he went to, and they ended up shooting up the entire house, shooting the people up, and then the same cop is in jail right now. And I think he's gonna end up getting a life sentence for what he did. Your family's going through quite a bit, um, and you're still going through quite a bit. When we see Balonis on TV, he's all, Put together, looking all solemn and, mm -hmm. and uh, stern and etc. And uh, but of course, inside there's a lot going on. Um, and particularly on the day that George died, how would you say the life, your life, changed, and how did your family's life change as a result of that? You know, I, I was a truck driver, so I was on my way, and we rarely went out of town. We only went to like Louisiana. I'm from, I'm from Texas, so we didn't really go far. I was on my way to go to Oklahoma, and I received a phone call, and my wife, <laughs> she called me twice, and I was like, well, I'm trying to go get this money, because we was actually moving into this bigger house. So from that point on, I stopped, and she sent me a video, and I sent the video to my cousin, because I didn't want to look at the video, because in my mind, I knew who it was, but I, I just wanted him to know. Next thing you know, he just said, because he called me PJ, he said, Pete, that's him. That's him. And I immediately like broke down, and I went into a rest area, and I was just crying, and I just kept crying. And it, it really messed me up. So I came home. I came home. And I got back as fast as I could. And my wife, she was just trying to console me the entire time. And, and my brothers, they were just crying so much. My and my sisters, we were going through so much. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that we were gonna be on the news. I had no idea that people were gonna be calling us from the radio stations. Mm -hmm. I was at the point of time where I didn't, I didn't want to talk to nobody. I was, I was just in pain. You know, it, 
I was just thinking about the humanity mm -hmm. of everything and the compassion that I had for myself. I was thinking about these are police officers. Why would they do that? So next thing you know, Benjamin Crump and so many others, they were there. And they was they was trying to get me to understand that you are gonna be the focal point. You are gonna have to do the talking for your family because everybody else is down. Nobody wanted to speak. Nobody wanted to be about anything. They were just hurt. They were worried about everything. They did not like Minnesota police officers. They didn't like nothing. Because living in Houston, living in Texas, period, we see a lot of negative stuff from police officers. DEA jump out boys. They never do a lot of like proper things. You see people just get tased. And some of them died from being tased. Some of these guys just died from being shot up. And it's just, it's just in the inside knowing what my brother went through, what he was telling us about, telling us to just stay in the house, stay out of the streets. If you go on to the YMCA, go to the YMCA. He said, make sure they bring you home. Don't do that. He just took the attention away from being out there in the streets because he knew what he seen, he knew what was going on. The media gives us a, a snapshot of what they want us to see. And the media tells a story that is designed to sell those sensational issues that are most prevalent. And unfortunately, we have a hunger for the negative. <clears throat> and many times that's how it's fun. But in the case of the Floyd family, in the case of, of what you all saw and what you all have surmised since that time and any feelings that you might have had with regards to the law enforcement end of it, um, I assure you the candid conversations that we've had with Mr. Floyd point a, a different picture than what you perhaps have seen on the television. I want to ask you, Salonis, and, and certainly um, I know you needed a moment there. I wanted to ask you with everything that, that you saw reported on the news and that this audience saw reported, mostly law enforcement professionals and et cetera, if there was any point that you could make to those here and to any law enforcement about your feelings, just in law enforcement, because I know that when we talked in Atlanta, you did not feel negative toward all law enforcement. That wasn't your feelings at all. But tell us, how do you feel now after all of this? What could you say to law enforcement that would be your true at heart? Well, I, I never felt that we should defund the police. I just feel like if I call the police, I should feel like I should be the one being killed. I called you for a reason. But uh, when, when I think about everything that's going on, and the police all over the world, they seeing what's going on in America. When they look at Ahmaud Arbery and Dante Wright and Pamela and Brown, and it's, it's, I can just keep naming people from Freddie Gray and keep going on. But when you look at Ahmaud Arbery, I, don't, I want all of them to understand, he was the charcoal. Breonna Taylor, she was the light of Floyd. And George Floyd, he was the man who set the world on fire. On fire. So, for everybody all across the world, from London, from Africa, from Japan, and all these places, China, all these people were contacting Brazil. All these people felt like they were tortured, and they weren't even here on the ground. But they knew that that was a bad situation. And they didn't have that understanding of why that man had his knee on my brother's neck for that long. My brother suffocated like a fish out of water. So I want all police officers to have that understanding that you all need to open up and get an understanding of who we are. We are human beings just like you. We believe the same thing. We want to be able to go home with our families the same way that you all can go home to you all family. We've been fighting a long fight and it's been a struggle. I've been trying to get this justice and police and George Floyd Policing Act, and it passed in the House, but never passed in the Senate. 
And if we can't get all of that taken care of, how can we survive? I and in Bel Air, where I come from, that's a place where it's a Jewish community. Mm -hmm. It's predominantly white. And it's a biracial couple that lived there. They had a biracial son. He went home and the police, when he tried to go in his door, his door. they killed him. Mm -hmm. Right in front of his door. And those same police officers, that same police officer, he didn't go to jail because of qualified immunity. Wow. To me, the stipulation that they had for qualified immunity helped him. And those people lost their, their son. They lost it. It's, it's, it's bad. So I just, I just want all police officers to have that understanding that you all took a sworn over. And you all need to be accountable to not just you all, but to the people out here. That's what I want. As we wrap up this particular session, obviously there's a role in all of this for all of us. I think all of us at some point have had fear for our lives. I think we can relate to other people who have fear for their lives, maybe not in the same way that they fear, but we understand what it is to be afraid. We all, as Mr. Floyd has just said, we all wanna come home. We all wanna believe that when we leave the house, we're gonna to return to the house right. without anyone taking unnecessary steps to put us down just by what they thought we might have done. It is not an easy job to be a law enforcement officer. It is not a job that I think I could do to make that spontaneous decision sometimes in a split second. But at the same time, we have no desire to see what we saw on the streets of Minneapolis with George Floyd. We have no desire to see what we saw in Baltimore. We have no desire to see what we saw in Georgia. But we cannot change that, as he said, unless we're willing to step up and be that change. We talked about earlier this week about the resolution that we got for the National Association of Blacks and Criminal Justice in Congress. I mentioned that you can find all federal legislation that you want to know about on congress.gov. Yeah. So on your way to YouTube, and on your way to watch Beyonce's concert, <laughs> and on your way to watch whatever you watch it on TikTok, stop by congress.gov. Right. Right. Look at the legislation. Know what your political leaders are doing. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. Don't wait for Sherman to do it. Don't wait for Sherman to tell you. Don't wait for me to tell you because it's not going to come for you if I have to tell you. <laughs> Get on congress.gov. Find out what's happening, what's not happening. That's if right. you didn't know the George Floyd Act was uh, not passed, if you thought it was, now you know. It's your turn. That's right. I fear for my life. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, I just want to let everybody know, I think about this all the time. Now, if they can make federal laws to protect the bald eagle, then they can make federal laws to protect people of color. There you go.